All right, and hello everyone. So welcome to our virtual event space. My name is Ali. You might recognize me from our Lake Forest Park location. I'm your host for this evening. Uh, I'm so excited to be introducing Jeffrey Seiger and Warren C. Easley here to discuss the new thriller in Jeffrey's Chief Inspector Andreas Caldas mystery series, One Last Chance. Uh, but before we get into the good stuff, uh, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. Uh, we're having more and more events in person lately, which is very exciting, uh, but our online event program is sticking around to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. So if you haven't gotten your hands on uh, any of the books that come out this evening and you'd like to, I will be linking books in chat. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in, grab a copy off the shelf, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local or not leaving your house, we of course ship. So go ahead and follow those links in chat over to our website. While you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up through the rest of the spring. So if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events, and exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So tonight we are here for about an hour and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in the chat. We love hearing from you. Uh, but when it comes time for questions, do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. While you're in our chat and question spaces, I want to remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. And finally, should any technical issues arise, which happens in the world of Zoom, uh, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them and we appreciate your patience and understanding. All right, so it is time for us to settle in because without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce Jeffrey Seiger, who fled his career as a partner at his Manhattan law firm to live in Greece. Uh, live on a Greek island and write mystery thrillers set in Greece. He's since been called Greece's thriller novelist of record by the Sunday New York Times book review, was the only American author named by the Greek government for writing novels serving as a guide to Greece and hailed as a literary star by Athens Insider magazine. In conversation this evening, I'm so pleased to welcome Warren C. Easley, author of the Cal Claxton Mysteries. He's received numerous nominations and awards, both for his short stories and his Cal Claxton series, uh, including a K-Show, our K-Snow Award for Fiction and the Spotted Owl Award for Best Mystery Written by a Writer writer in the greater Pacific Northwest. So the book this evening uh, is One Last Chance. It's the 12th book in the Andreas Caldas series. Uh, it's set on the uh, Aegean island of Ikaria, and I'm so sorry about any pronunciations that we're, we're failing at here, <laughs> but with its storied past of pirates and conquerors and current worldwide reputation for the longevity of its people. So thank you all so much for being here. Audience members, do not be shy in chat. If you need anything, I will be watching it. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome, both of you. The stage is yours. Uh-oh, are we oh, having a, a video no, issue? No. Again, Warren has to hit the buttons. There you go. You didn't going? scoot out on me, did you? No, I did not. I, oh, mean, I, can... <laughs> I can't, uh, for some reason. In the lower left, in the lower left, click the mic and click the, the, the camera. Yeah. Oh, uh oh, there we there go. Are. Okay, there wait, but now we're muted. <laughs> yeah, hit the, hit the mute button now, <laughs> the microphone. 
And he was a major science guy in business. This is fantastic. There we go. <laughs> now we know why he turned to mystery writing. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. We're in business now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, just want, I just want to say, as proud as I am of my new book, it's the 12th in the series, um, I'm really more than proud to be here with my good buddy, whoops, to be my good buddy, Warren, because he just won the Spotted All Award which is really quite an honor to have for his book, No Witness. So congratulations and good to hear it. Yeah, see, good to you. see you. But I still want your job in the Greek Isles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to say, I certainly enjoyed it over there. It's, it's, it's given me the chance to see an awful lot of that country and it's captured my soul. Yeah, awesome. and also it shows. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, this new book takes me to a strange place. It, it, this this place, Ikaria, which is you pronounce it correctly back there, Ali. By the way, uh, Ikaria is a place that it was. I mean, my God, it has a history going back to seven thousand BCE, but it's always been conquered, always been played upon by pirates. It's really it's it was the poorest island in Greece, and uh, as a result of that, it had a lot of interesting history to it. But that, that, that's where I was. That's where I was for this book. There's a, um, there's a, I guess I should say a little bit about the island itself so people can understand it. This particular place has a mountainous stony uh, backbone to it. It has very few ports that are, that are, that are usable. It also has a history of being invaded, invaded by pirates, invaded by conquerors, <laughs> exploited by businesses. And in fact, back in the 16th century, the Aegean was so plagued, so plagued by pirates that the populace moved out of the, moved away up into the mountains. They, they, they created secret towns to hide in where you couldn't see them from the, from, the, from the harbor. And they put their houses behind rocks and caves and all sorts of different places. All of this was done and lived like that for 80 years. For 80 years, these people lived like that. It was their century of obscurity, so to speak. And their life never really changed much. They never trusted the people who came there to take care of them afterward. And the strangest thing is, today, modern Ikaria is one of five places in all the world that are called blue zones. Their population lives longer than anywhere else on earth. For whatever they went through, they ended up like that. One of three live into the 90s, and many live into the hundreds. It's almost as good as living in Oregon. <laughs> Just about. Well, that's where we are there. Uh, well, you, you've been placing your books now in Oregon since Cal moved from Los Angeles, right? Yes. Yeah. Cal Claxton. And yeah, he, uh, yeah, you know, he uh, was a hotshot prosecutor down in Los Angeles uh, for the city. And um, his wife committed suicide, and he kind of took an early out with the city, had almost a breakdown, came to Oregon to reinvent himself, opens a one-man law practice, and, and falls in love with Oregon. And, and his, he finds an old farmhouse in the Oregon wine country, and um, his, he has one daughter, Claire, and she says, you know, I'm afraid you're going to go there and become a recluse, so I want you to get a hobby and uh, get a dog. So he gets a dog, he gets an Australian shepherd named Archie. Archie, yeah. Yeah, which is a key character in all the books, and he learns to fly fish, among other things. Sounds so, yeah. pretty familiar to someone like, sounds like somebody else I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, except I'm not a lawyer, I was never a lawyer. All right, I, I understand that. Having been one myself, like I, I understand, I understand. <laughs> yeah, no, that's he's. Uh, I, I've enjoyed. I've always enjoyed your books, Archie too. Yeah, it's a certain thing about that. It has been. Yeah, that well, way. He's, yeah, he's an e easy character to write. Yeah, it is. But, uh, you know, this this book. You talk about characters. I don't know. How, I don't know how Archie can get his own book. Uh, <laughs> Joe Perry could probably do it for him, but I. I this book was the 12th book, uh, oh, One Last Chance. Yes. And in it, I wanted to give one of the characters who's been with me practically since the beginning, 
her moment in the spotlight. I'm talking now about Maggie, who yeah. is Chief Inspector Collis' uh, administrative assistant. But I, I wanted it to be a book that would basically allow her to show her strengths. That means her, her strong commitment and faith in her friends and deep faith in a church. Uh, but I had to find the right place where I could test her will and test what's going on. And because of the history of Ikaria that I just discussed, um, it, I, I never, I'd been there several times. It, it didn't hit me, but then it did hit me. This was a place in which I could set the book. And why? We're writing a book during pandemic times, a contemporary book during pandemic times. But I didn't want to write a book that was either going to overplay or understate the effect of the events of, of COVID. I didn't want it to be occupying the book that way. Right. Yet at its core, it was, face, it was facing the consequences of COVID. Yeah. And considering how Ikaria had this horrible history with the people have suffered so through to be able to survive it only because of their own strong will and their reputation of being able to live as long as they can. It seemed like the perfect setting for a book tied into the pandemic, mm -hmm. an ability to overcome an ability to live long. Those were the two things. Yeah. And so that's how I ended up. I ended up there with that book. Um, yeah, it was, it, it worked out very nicely that way. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, all of us you know, writers uh, have that decision to make what to do about the pandemic. And yes. my, my books have been uh, chronological. And so I, I really was confronted with that question on book nine, which is with my editor right now. And book nine, I had to figure out what, what am I going to do? Am I kind of pretend <laughs> that the pandemic didn't happen? Or am I, and I finally decided, no, I can't do that, and I'm going to take it head on. So I just made I admire that the story. That's that's good. When my last book came out, it had, already, it had been written before the pandemic hit. The pandemic hit. I wrote it about an island of Naxos, which I really like. And I said to myself, I'm not going to rewrite it now to bring in the pandemic. I'll let the book stand as it is, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And it yeah. did. But this book, as I was writing, I said, how can I ignore it? Yeah, exactly. The one, thing, the one thing I did is I, I put in a, a reference. I was hoping it would be in a rearview mirror when the book came out. I put in a reference to the, to the, uh, the pandemic of 2019 to 2021. And my editor said, are you sure 2021 is the end date? So I, I kicked <laughs> yeah. it up to 2022. Please, yeah. God, may that be the right one. Yeah. But uh, that, was, that was the thing that, I, that was the one thing that I had to do to sort of accept the fact that it's out there, something we have yeah. to deal with. Uh, but I, I had Mario, I'll tell you, I was writing a column in, for the Athens Insider magazine. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's the largest distribution English language magazine in Greece. And I, in the beginning of 2020, uh, the, the publisher asked me if I would be willing to write a column. They wanted to call it, get this, listen now everybody, the COVID Chronicles. Okay, now. <laughs> That really is an appealing title. You know, you, everybody wants to read is in the middle of it about COVID. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah I, I wrote about, I wrote about 10, 10, 10 articles of that. And I finally called her up in the end of the year, the end of that year. And I said, 20, 2020, I said, my friend, I don't think as much as I'm making it light and funny and talking about things and how it's affecting the arts is what, the, what it was supposed to be about. I said, I don't think this is going to carry the day anymore. I don't think people want to continue to read about it. And she said, yes, she agreed. Which, which really made me think even more so I don't know if I want to write a book that's going to focus as heavily on it. I think you're in the forefront for this one. I think I can't wait to read how you handle it. Yeah, well, I think it's a big gamble. I, uh, you know, I, I've had some comments that people say, oh, I don't want to be reminded of that. On the other hand, I, I, uh, I think it, uh, it was a story that, you know, the, the pandemic becomes part of the story it, uh, and people have to work through that. I actually started it right at the beginning of 2020 mm -hmm. and, and ended it uh, right in uh, March, middle of March in 2020. That's when everything shut down in Oregon. So I gave it a very short amount of time just for Cal to solve the crime. So yeah, oh, it, 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 I like I'm that. interested to see how it works out. 
Yeah, and I'm sure it'll work out well. If anybody can do it, you can. The, uh, what people don't realize is that if you're writing historicals, it's fine <laughs> because you know what's happened in that yeah, history. Exactly. I think it's, I, I'm going to get, I know I'm going to get, I'm going to get calls on this one. Yeah. So if you're writing an historical, it's, it's often easier. Yeah. When you're writing, uh, when you're writing a more contemporary one, you've got to guess what's going to happen. And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. And I don't know. If, I actually had one book we had a pool because it, it, it anticipated everything so right on the nose that it looked like I just lifted it from the news. So yeah. I had to rewrite it. That was not wow. a pleasant moment. But that's what you risk when you're trying to, if you're trying like we do to write on the edge of, wow. so, of so social change, society's issues, you're always running up against the fact, the fact that when you get to the end and your book comes out, something's happened to make yeah. it look wrong yeah. or, yeah. or something other along those lines. Yeah, well, I think uh, the uh, pandemic has made that a lot tougher. I mean, yeah. I'm working on book 10 now um, and I've got like 35 pages, but yeah, and I'm kind of, I'm doing, I have the same problem you do. I'm trying to figure out how to handle the pandemic and is it gone or is it not gone? Where is it? Yeah, I, uh, I'm working it's... my way through that. I'm sure you will. I'm sure that's, that's that's the beauty of the of what we get to do now, as opposed to what we did for our other lives. Huh. I know that when I was a lawyer, I had to write. I, I, I did much the same thing as I'm doing now. I'd marshal facts to support my conclusion, mm -hmm. but then I had to use truth. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. By the way, uh, <laughs> but but doing it now, I, I can do other things. I can I, you can. You can create these these realities that you get the reader to stick with, even though they may not be true realities. They stick with it. But if you do it well enough, when you jump from the improbable to the impossible, they'll come with you. Yeah. So that's something you can do. And I, much of it is, I find I use that skill that I had as a lawyer to try to create arguments to make that happen. I, I don't know how your experience is, how your roots have helped you with that. Uh, well, yeah, I, uh, I had have a PhD in physical chemistry and spent a career in uh, research and development and international business. So I would say that, uh, but I always like to write, but I would say that uh, the technical writing and the business writing taught me conciseness, mm -hmm. taught me how to take a complicated issue, which my plots tend to be complicated, how to take a complicated issue and make it give it clarity and well, that's maybe, a gift yeah maybe pace uh you know don't waste people's time but having said that i had to i really had to work hard to learn how to write prose and i'd be curious what did you do anything to uh i did a, i did a couple of specific things to help me in my writing i was wondering if, what what did you do to kind of make that transition it's funny how you say, you say, when I was a kid, I, I <laughs> wow, when I was a child, uh, I thought I was going to be a writer. In fact, when I, when I was going to a camp, I want to rewrite the plays for the yeah. counselor. They got a little oh, cool. perturbed at that. Yeah. But you know, I was in high school. I'll never forget this. I played football freshman year. And, and after one particularly ignominious loss, the mother of our best player walked into the locker room dragged him out dragged her son out saying you got a scholarship to play basketball somewhere else you're not going to play with this lousy team all of us wished our mothers had dragged us out well i now move fast forward to the end of the end of the school year and i'm in my this advanced english class and the teacher says uh i want you to hear what you could be like if you really apply yourself because this is someone who's going to read to you what he's writing so in walks the football player the guy whose mother had dragged him out of the out of the room and so he's reading and I'm listening and say, oh my God, if he can do that, there must be a million people can do that. I'm gonna have to do something else, find a new career. <laughs> I suggest, I, I told my father to become a sculptor that he got slapped out of my head very quickly. So I uh, went on to be what I did. Years later, when I was, an event happened that got me back to doing that writing. Uh, I, said, I said the story to somebody and I finished by saying, by the way, that kid who, I was right about that kid because that kid turned out to be John Edgar Wideman, one of the top writers in the world. Yeah. John has won every award you can think of. He is one of the, he's one of the great writers. And so he, it's John's fault that I stopped writing, but I also was in a position to become a lawyer so I could afford to write. Yeah. As you know, the writing is a lousy way to make a living, but a wonderful way to make a life. Amazing. So, yeah, so that's what that was, that's how that was. And uh, I, 
but I actually physically learned the craft of writing as a litigator, which oh. you had to, you had to, you had to make arguments and use the facts and told a story mm -hmm. and made it happen. And I'll never forget, I was sitting, as five years out, five years of doing all these affidavits and all these briefs, I was sitting on a bedroom floor surrounded by papers and I'm writing and suddenly something hit me. It said, wait a minute, I should do this. And it was like an epiphany. Mm -hmm. And I sure enough, I went in and I gave the affidavit to the partner. I was worried. He said, who wrote this for you? <laughs> I said, I did. He says, congratulations. You just stepped over the bounds. It was great. And then I became wow. like one of the leading writers for this firm. Wow, and the, what is it? But it's, it's, I, I didn't know. It's, yeah. it's the same thing as what you did. You did your work. You tried your best. And it worked out for you. Because by the way, the, all those things you said made you what you are. Yeah. Um, when I was teaching writing, mystery writing in a university, uh, kids taken, they didn't all want to be mystery writers. They said, forget about being a mystery writer. You're going to learn to write in a way that's convincing and it tells a story. So whenever your boss asks you for something, you're not going to give them something that's silly or really half-assed. You're going to give them something which is thought through and, and meaningful. It's going to help you with your career. Yeah. And like, I mean, you obviously were a great writer. But it, this is, it's funny. I'll never forget that. I've been asked to host... There's the Greater Pittsburgh Festival of Books has its uh, inaugural event this May. And I can drive there because of my knee. I can drive there. And uh, I'm going to be hosting the mystery section on that. Very good. So I'm going home again. I'll be literally two blocks away from the high school football field where I was when I realized I couldn't write like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm coming back to be the representing the mystery yeah. committee, uh, uh, yeah. community in that particular. So it's, life's a circle. No, I, I, I kind of uh, came on the writing thing. It was almost an accident. I, uh, when I retired for the second time <laughs> uh, out here in, in Oregon, I was actually on a cross-country flight coming back from a personal business meeting, and I forgot my damn book. And it was, uh, and I'll tell you what the book was. It was James Lee Burke's Heaven's <laughs> Prisoners, which is a really good book. And... Uh, so I had nothing to do on the plane. I was going from Atlanta to Portland and I had, but I had a spiral notebook in my briefcase and a pen. And uh, so I said, you know, I wonder if I could do something like Burke and set it in, in Oregon. And it just, the idea just came to me. I was just so, uh, I was really impressed with Burke. I just loved his books. And Good reason. Uh, so yeah, exactly. And I, uh, when we landed, I had 23 pages, handwritten pages. And yeah, they, and I thought, damn, that was fun. And so, See, I don't, yeah. I, I, I don't even have to ask you where you get your ideas from. You just told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, but the, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's really funny how you, you that, that, that strange mo moment happens and it happened on that airplane for you. Yeah. You realize that you, you realize you could write. Yeah, a different way. I mean, you realize it's, a, it's yeah. like it changes you. Um, I, 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 that's that's a heck of a that's a heck of an inspiration to have. A heck of an inspiration to have. Yeah, I, I, uh, I want to. Yeah, as a result of that, I wrote three books uh, over the uh, took several years. I wrote three books. They weren't very good, but you know, I, I kept getting better. And and uh, uh, Poison Pin actually started to become somewhat interested in what I was writing, but they. Didn't give me a contract. So I so then I wrote the fourth book. And by then I thought, you know what? I, I think I've got this. I think I know what I'm doing. And I, I wrote the fourth book, which was Matters of Doubt. And I, yes. I sent book. it uh, into Poison Pin and Crickets. I heard nothing. <laughs> I thought, damn, you know, they, they like the other ones. This one's much better. And finally, the submissions editor, you know her, Annette. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I sent her a note and I said, Annette, I sent you this manuscript. I got nothing back. And I was really mad because I figured they didn't even bother to answer me. I'm, I'm just going to do something else. I almost quit. And she sent me a note back and said, resubmit. We lost your manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No comment. Yeah. I mean, it, and so I resubmitted it and I got a three book contract about a month later. Well, it was great stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's what you said. You had, you had three drawer novels. 
Yeah, I have two. I have two and a half. They still sit there. Every once in a while, I try to pull something out of them to use, and they yeah. say, "I can't use that. That's <laughs> I'm so much beyond there." But yeah. we all have drawer novels. People think, "Oh, he just wrote it. It's fine." Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Look at look at the amount of, the number of trees we killed to get here. Exactly. Uh, but that's wow. that's that's a great. Story. I didn't know that's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah. We, 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 yeah, we lost your submission. Well, that's. <laughs> Yeah, and I really was ticked off. I, I can't gonna... imagine why. Yeah. yeah. God bless them. They're great people there, but that happens. Yes. That happens. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no reflection on Poison Pen. I think they no, had no, changed their I'm submission process. And I, it was probably my fault. Yeah, yeah no, that, Poison Pen, as you know, has been very loyal to their authors. They have yes. been the old, it was, it, it, it's, a, it's a good group of people. But yes. all, we all have funny stories because you know, in the, they were in the, they were independent before they became part of source books. Yeah, and they they did what they had to do to keep it going, and uh, they really, they really, uh, they helped make my career whatever it whatever it is. They helped make it that way. Yeah, and uh, we you got the, the attention of the reviewers and all those sorts of things, which is important. Mm -hmm. It is important. Well, you have that loyal. Your your series is is uh, taken off I, I'm, I'm, I'm i'm very pleased with it. i got i got uh I, this new book <laughs> the new book one last chance to say it again i gotta hold the cover note like this one here it got <laughs> uh, that, one? that one yeah it got a star review from um from from um book list in which they said it's the best yet now calling it the best yet can be taken several ways. It can be taken as what? What, what do you what do you say about my other things here? I mean, what, what are you telling me here? But then again, the other hand it is, uh, if you're doing something, you want to be getting better. You'd rather hear that than what happened. So I'm taking it as better than what happened. So we'll go there. But it's it's fun. But that, I I really I thank I thank Poison Pen Source Books for that sort of situation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I really, I really, you know, for people who are looking to be writers, you got to persevere. You just have to persevere mm -hmm. and have confidence in yourself. Yes. But uh, but don't go into it thinking you're going to be, you're going to be burning up the bestseller charts. I mean, have that as an aspiration in your mind, but mm -hmm. keep your day job. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah. the, you know, the, the, uh, the advice I give, uh, I get, the, probably the main thing is I tell writers that, uh, finish what you're working on. You know, I know a lot of people yeah. who are really good writers and they're, they're working on the same book for 10 years. You know, the great American novel. And uh, I'd say you're better off if, if you know, if it's, if it's not working, go on to something else, but try and finish it, even if it's not perfect. And then go, learn from that and go on to the next project. Absolutely. I mean, what you just said, if, if you do the perfect novel, all you can do after that is get worse. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's, the, but, the, and what is it's the ad, it's the line that don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah. There's, there, there's, a, there's a real problem with that. I see with many artists, artists, including writers, mm -hmm. that they just want to make it perfect. Yeah. And it never goes anywhere. Yeah. I know a guy who, he wrote a book, I think it was seven, eight years ago, and he got great reviews in the New York Times, everything. I think he just wanted to write one book because I haven't heard a word from him since that time. Yeah, I mean, you've got to you've got to produce if you wish to be, if you wish to, with certain exceptions, uh, you've got to produce if you want to make it happen. And it's also you get rusty. You got to get you got to keep the juices flowing every day to do something to write. Otherwise, you get rusty. Yeah, you got to work you, the muscle. I think, and I think that's one advantage to uh, writing a series is that you, you know, have, there's a certain continuity that takes you into the next book because you, you've, got a, you've got a set of recurring characters. You know, you've got, uh, you know, certain themes that you're interested in. And I think it, it, it lends to being able to keep going. If you're just writing one standalone after another, that, could, that to me would be a lot tougher. Yeah, that's a different, that's a different thing, I agree. Would you think ever think of writing a standalone? It probably would be the precursor to another series. Would you ever think of doing that? Yeah, yeah. I think everybody does, right? I mean, I'm I'm working on number ten. I'll never catch you, Jeff, but 
Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that as a, we'll both live forever. Let's go that way. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, I, I uh, uh, yeah, the, the thoughts entered my mind, but you know, I haven't had that sort of uh, something crystallized and said, yeah, you got to do this. So, yeah, as, as you know, I do it. Yeah, as you know, I just took a shot at it. Maybe it comes from my training as a litigator, the law, a court lawyer, is that every once in a while you should, if you're if you're basically a defense lawyer, every once in a while you should take a plaintiff's side. So you get to see the other side, you clean out your pipes mm -hmm. and you get a whole different perspective on things. Yeah. And um, the, the book I wrote, the other book, the, the non calvis book, I've been, I, I've been meaning to write it for years and years and years. And I had written the beginning. And then one day over COVID days, I said, what the hell? I got nothing else, I'll write that. So I wrote this thing and we'll see where it goes. But it was something I'd, me I'd meant to do for many years, had a different pr uh, approach to it. And so we'll see what comes of it, but I'm never gonna give up the Caldas books. So it's like family. Yeah, and exactly. if, if I did, if I did, I'd be thrown out of the family. I'd probably be lynched in the, in the streets of Mykonos. Yeah, people want to see that. But it's, I, I can't say, I can't say enough how pleased I am at the decision I made to have left the practice of law when I did. Uh, I liked it, enjoyed it. I had a wonderful career there. I was a name partner in my own New York firm, and. But boy, it's a different thing, man. You really, it, 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 the satisfaction you get and the pleasant, it's doing something I've always wanted to do and have been able to do it and to meet people like you, yeah. it really is a different thing. Yeah. I'm uh, very lucky to do that. Yeah, I agree. I, I uh, yeah, I had, uh, I don't, I spent, I don't know, 32 years in the traces, 33 years. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I didn't, uh, when I retired, I didn't miss a day of it, <laughs> not a day. And boy, when I, yeah, when I started writing, that was just, just great. And I had the time, suddenly had the time. I always had the interest, but I never had the time. And, and all of a sudden I had the time and it, um, it's great. I agree. And I, wow. and I think the other thing I will say is that writers are most damn, they're really interesting people. They're really... They're really fun, interesting people that I like to hang out with. I, I do too. I, I do too. It's a, it's a so many great friends. So many great friends. That's why I, we were talking before about going to certain events that we haven't been to in a couple of years. I, I miss the camaraderie of getting together with the people. That matter. And, and by the way, this this isn't. I can only speak directly to the camaraderie among mystery writers or crime writers. Yeah. There are other writers. I mean, other genres may not be the same, but we're blessed to be with this group. And uh, they're really, it's really, really, they're supportive of one another. Yes. Yeah, very. They really supportive. are. I mean, there's a, there's, and that's, that's good. That's, that's good. It, it gives you a real sense of community. Yeah. And it's something that, uh, that I'm, I treasure. And I, and I know, I mean, we, I was at Iceland Noir last winter and we were, we, yeah. <laughs> we were uh, standing, I was standing with Ian Rankin and Anthony Horowitz, as a matter of fact. And there was a guys about to go off and people say, we're standing here watching, we're, we're, we're three old guys just waiting for the other guys to go off. <laughs> they laugh, thank God. It's mostly, yeah. But it, 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 it's fun, it's fun, it's fun. Yeah. It was all, meet those really nice people, really nice people. Sort of like coming to Oregon again. Exactly, well, you need to do that. I know, I'd love to do that. I love going out there and, and, and it's like, It'd be Washington, Oregon, California. That was the way I'd love to do it, up and down the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, and I hope to be back there very soon because- oh, You're welcome. Yeah, I mean, also we, you know, reading your books or reading my books, you get to see a, a social issue, societal issue that's being addressed because we don't shy away from that. Yeah. We do address it. And it's not preaching. It's not preaching. Yeah, that kills right. the view. But it gets the point across and people start to think about it. I mean, your, your latest book, uh, no witness. That one talks about, as I recall, that talks about the ex exploitation of, of migrant immigrants. Yeah, and uh, that's a hot, right on the button topic. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it, you, it well deserved the award that you received. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I think yeah, I think you may have established a new character too. By the way, <laughs> Jim Mateo. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's a tricky thing. Uh, um, 
you know, the, we, there's a lot of partisanship, a lot of divisiveness in this country right now. So you got to be careful and you can't, I think, and I, I really, I use the uh, social issues as kind of a, uh, a, a scaffolding to hang the story on. Mm -hmm. And in the case of No Witness, it was the, the migrant community in the, in the uh, wine country. Um, but, you know, you're right. You, you can't have an agenda. Uh, you can't preach. And at the end of the day, uh, even though I have, this, I have this social issue that cuts through the whole book, at the end of the day, it has to be a mystery. It has to be, oh, yes. about, it has to be about the mystery and not about some agenda. And if Absolutely. you do that, I think people will go with you. Absolutely. If you don't, if it doesn't serve the plot, it's out. I mean, yeah. you really can't just throw something in. I mean, I, 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 I have a little bit of a, I get a little bit of an edge because I'm writing about a, a country other than America. They have their own strong disagreements over there. But uh, I, I take on those issues over there that are affecting them. In fact, one, I don't know what's going to come of this particular one. Barbara Peters that said I was like Cassandra because I'd say things that come true and no one would have believed me and they did. I wrote the last book I wrote, which is called A Deadly Twist. It took place on the island of Naxos, which I truly love. The, pr the premise of it was the dispute between those who want to bring in more tourism and those who want to preserve the old ways. That's a problem that exists in every tourist area. Right. And what I said at the time was that luckily they've been able to keep the long from extending the runway because as soon as you extend the runway you start to bring in the big jets which brings in the the, the cheaper tours and all the stuff that comes down that's what contributed to the fall of several other places i wrote that two years ago yeah. i just heard i heard yesterday from my buddy over there that they've gotten right they're extending the airport uh, yeah oh my god so yeah. i you know i told you i told you folks what will uh, happen you know uh, the, yeah but but I, I don't get much heat because it's i'm writing i'm it has nothing to do with America. It has to do with over in Greece. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm sure I'd have the airlines, the everybody on me. Yeah, I, of course I, I would. I get a few comments now and then, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't shy away. I, you know, and I want my characters to be authentic. I want them to have opinions, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to duck it. But on the other hand, uh, I want to make sure that any research I do or anything I'm dealing with. Uh, in that area is accurate and that I'm, you know, putting the right facts out. Well, you, you face a challenge, I think probably the same as I do, that when you're trying to write, you're not sure what the hell is going to happen. Excuse me, I didn't mean that curse word. I apologize. Probably, is that you're, you're trying to figure out what's going to happen as you're writing. You know where you want, you, you, you're, you're, you're not, you don't have an outline. I don't think you work from an outline. No, I do not. Yeah. 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 I do Nor not. do I. My, my memory couldn't remember what I wrote in the outline, so I don't bother to yeah. deal with it. I just yeah. let it take you right go. But that's really a challenge when you're trying to deal with a social issue. Yeah. Because certain subliminal well, things sneak out into it, so you better catch it later on. Well, I mean, when you don't work from an outline, everything's a challenge. Yes. Because, yes. you know, you were talking about putting our characters into bad situations. And, you know, I can, I can get my characters into really <laughs> bad situations. And then the question is, you know, okay, how do I get them out? And... and you know, you, you touched on it, but I'm a pantser, so I don't, I don't yeah. have, and I, it's not that I, I chose that. It's the only way I can write. I have to write to find out what happens. I, I'm the same way. And, you know, it, and when you get that sort of, it just happened to me this afternoon. I was really stuck on something. And then it hit me. It's such a, such a feeling of satisfaction that you were able to come up with that way to handle that situation. And then it's like, it's, I think of writing sometimes as, you're cruising along a flat, beautiful plane, easy going, and suddenly you hit a precipice. And you got, how are you, you going to get up this thing here? And there's crocodiles around you if you're not careful. But I got past the crocodiles this time. Yeah, At least today good. I did. Yeah, but that's, not, oh, go ahead. No, I was saying, that's just, that was my lucky day today. Good. Yeah, good. You know, I, 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 I like uh, E.L. Doctorow. As a oh, yes. That, that, you know, you probably know this one, but writing is like driving at night in the fog, you can only see as far as your headlights, but if you keep going, you'll get there. And that, that to me is the, the perfect way to, to summarize that. It is, I, I love that. I just somehow think sometimes in, the, in a deep white fog, you better be careful you don't hit a polar bear. <laughs> Otherwise it's... <laughs>
<laughs> but no, it's right. It's absolutely right. That's all. That's exactly how I write. I have no idea where I'm going to be, and I'll just wait wow. and see. And well, wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I thought I was. You know, I, I'm out there on the edge. I really. Uh, yeah. Wow. There was, a, but there's no one. Me. There's no, <laughs> there's no one right way to do that. Yeah. Uh, people, you're, you're as you said originally earlier on, you're wired that way. It's how you are. Yeah. There was a book called Making Story. Tim Hallen and put together, wow. edited, it, and he asked about twenty different writers to put down what they did, how they how wow. they did it. He went from the most fervent plotter yeah. who put down everything, almost down to the paragraphs of the book, to the wildest swinging some someone like you, pantser. And the thing was, at the end, you couldn't. Both all were great writers, and. After the editor came in and smoothed out some of the things from a from a pantser being too perhaps far off and down some gullies to a, a plotter who seemed to have lost its freshness, they bring it together and you can't tell which either one did. Yeah. You can't tell. But you've got to go with how you're wired. Yeah. No, I, I'm convinced it, it it's about something in the brain. No question about uh, it. Because, you know, I tried. In fact, you know, Barbara Peters, we, we right. showed... Right, being the, an editor, and she said, "You know, you you need to maybe think about edit or out, outlining." So I I bought a bunch of books and read up on outlining, and I was I had four books I read. I didn't do any good at all. My my brain just doesn't work that way. Warren, she said, outboarding. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> she figured you're a fisherman. Get out there, outboarding. There you go. Anyway, we had that's a uh, no. It's it's fun times. We all had great experiences with that. I don't. I had one experience teaching where this student was. My assignment was, was the craziest on my part. Is that every day a student had to write 250 words of their novel, and I'd edit it and get it back to them at night. And to me, I meant I never got to be before one in the morning. There was like I had like 15 students in this class. But this one student, had, I could see she was struggling, but she was very good. And I said, you know what? I think you're trying to, as I had talked about my style, you're trying to be a pantser. I want you to be an outliner. Mm -hmm. Go be an outliner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told her, try that. Next day she came back and she gave me this perfect chapter in her book. Yeah. But and I don't know how to say this, but I'll just say it straight out. It was a sex scene. <laughs> And it was so explicit. I, I didn't know what to, all I did is I, on the paper, I wrote, good job. <laughs> and I let it go. There's no way I could correct it. But truthfully, it was a really great scene because she really did it, but it wasn't the scene I was expecting her to write. So that, that, I thought that was funny. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't go back there. Uh, so that was, uh, that, yeah, where, where, where did you do that, Teach? I remember when you I, went. I taught a couple, a couple of intercessions at, uh, a college, Washington and Jefferson in, in, in Western Pennsylvania. That's where I had gone to college. I didn't take English courses, surprisingly. Yeah. I was a political science and biology major. I wasn't sure I was going to be a doctor or a lawyer. So uh, I figured English, I wasn't going to do that. I remember in past history and one of the things that happened. And so I went to, uh, I went on from there. Yeah. And they invited me back to teach. And I think the teachers come back right now, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Sorry, I hate to interrupt, but we are heading towards that time where we're going to switch over to do some audience questions. So, so far, the audience is shy, which is totally fine. Um, but if you have any questions out there, go ahead and throw those in the Q&A, and I will ask them now while we have their attention. In the meantime, I have a couple of questions. So... You both have been talking a little bit about genre over this conversation. Um, what was it that drew you to mysteries in the first place? And for both of you, for both of you. Uh, uh, well, I, I had wanted to write a book about Mykonos, about the island I knew very well. I want to talk about its politics, its society, its, 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 its culture. And it seemed to me the best vehicle for telling it was a murder mystery because I could I could create various clues and questions around different characters on the island that spoke to what they did, and if you think about mystery as being uh, an effort at restoring order to a fractured society, when you use it, you you created the beginning the worst possible thing murder, 
and then you work at bringing it back together to the piece. So at the end, there's optimism because there's a, there is indeed that success. So I wrote a murder mystery that had a resolution at the end that made all the Maconians happy and no one lynched me. That was why I was happy to do that. Yeah, I, I'd say for me, um, yeah, I just, I love reading mysteries. So I was, you know, I, I've read everything, but I think, you know, early days is Tony Hillerman, uh, Sarah Paretsky, Michael Conley, uh, and James Lee Burke. And James Lee Burke was really the guy that just, yeah, that, when I read Burke, that's when I really got interested in writing. But yeah, I, I uh, uh, it, for me, it was a really simple choice. And I think the, if, you, if I was to dig very deeply, you know, all mysteries are about the question of why do people do these terrible things? You know, I, and I, I think I kind of want to explore that. With each book, I take a look at it. And, uh, but yeah. It's a great genre. I, mm -hmm. It really is. I agree. Follow-up question. If you were to write in a different genre, if you were going to give a different genre a, a shot, what would you what would you pick? Or would you? Well, I actually would probably, I'm not sure what genre would be different. I think plays. Mm. A play because yeah. uh, I'm really into dialogue. And mm -hmm. I read more, I read a lot of plays. August Wilson is a favorite of mine. Uh, and so I think I would probably find myself reading more towards the plays. Mm. Very cool. Interesting. Yeah, I, uh, well, incidentally, I, I love dialogue. I love your dialogue, by the way. And uh, yeah, that dialogue for me is how I learn about my characters. I get them talking. Yes. And then I write in first person. But I get them talking and then I start to understand them. But yeah, I think if I had, uh, if I had to try something else, I might try to write, you know, some something that's sort of literary, perhaps. Very cool. Very cool. Speaking of characters, you both have been writing series with the same group of characters for like a really long time. Um, would you say that your relationship to them has changed over the years? Do you feel like you know them as people? <laughs> I, I usually talk to them the night before I go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. No, I do. I, I, yeah, you can't help but feel that way. You do. You become part of them. You think about this and you say, I can't do that to them. I can't do this to them. Uh, it, 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 that's one thing you tend to do. I mean, uh, I, I just, as I mentioned before, I did a new, I, I wrote a new book, which I'm not sure where it's going to go with it, but the central character is like a combination of, uh, of George Smiley, Sherlock Holmes and the Equalizer. <laughs> so there's a lot to work with there. But uh, I, I basically, I, I basically find my characters are like family. And I try to try to take care of them. Yeah. Or they take care of me, I should put it that way. Interesting. Yeah, I, I um, the same way. I, when I sit down to write, it, you know, it's almost like going home. Uh, when I sit in front of the computer, I got everything, what, you know, I'm, I'm really starting to focus. Uh, it's like going home. And, uh, and I'd say that the characters, um, give you an example, uh, uh, you know, the, my, my protagonist has a dog named Archie and he's modeled after a dog. We have a, 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 a dog that we had a tricolor Australian shepherd named Buddy. And he lived 14 years and, and, and so Buddy is Archie in the books, and he's just, and he's a big, you know, Buddy had a big uh, uh, personality, but now we have another, Buddy passed on, we have another tricolor Australian Shepherd, and his name is Archie, so, you know, he's, he's part of the film. <laughs> I love that. So I have a question here from Teresia, if I said your name wrong, I'm so sorry, um, asking, do you think you need to read your previous books in order to appreciate the most recent one? Each book, well, each book and, and it can be picked up independently because you don't have to know anything. But what the, what the fans say whenever that question is asked and someone volunteers to answer it for me <clears throat> is that the characters grow over the series. They do grow. So if you want to follow their lives, then you start at the beginning and go forward. But you can pick up any book and read it straight through and you don't need to uh, have read the others to understand what's going on. 
Yeah. I don't, I don't go back and talk about old cases, anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Ditto. Ditto. I, I, I try to make it, make sure that each one stands alone, but, but it has the continuity at the same time. Mm. Very cool. So, um, I'm going to ask something a little bit more specific about this book. And I know it's kind of hard because of spoilers. Um, but was there anything in this book? What, like, what was the easiest day working on this book? What was the funnest day? And what was the hardest day? <laughs> the easiest day was when I came up with the uh, opening, set, or opening paragraph. Because the way I write a book is I suddenly comes to me and I write this opening paragraph which I say is, this is it. It shows me the path where everything is going to happen <laughs> yeah. in the world. Yeah. And then the, the hardest day is when I realize I got to get cut that paragraph <laughs> because it, it, things have changed. But uh, that's, that's, sort of a, that's sort of what I would say would be the time. That's too funny. What about you, Warren? Yeah, the, uh, for me, it's interesting. The, um, for some reason, the first 100 pages of the book are really easy. They just go like a shot. You know, and and then I hit the mushy middle and and you know, <laughs> trying to tie everything together and it gets really tough. I'd say the hardest part in No Witness was, you know, trying to figure out, uh, you know, how I get my protagonist out out alive. <laughs> yeah, that was tough. I had to, and I I always resort to going on long walks with with Archie, with my daughter, <laughs> uh, when I can kind of clear my head and think. <laughs> you're like well bud sorry yeah. this time you're dying <laughs> <laughs> i'm close to that yeah right. she says i'm sorry but i'm running off with the neighbor <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see we have just a couple more minutes audience members so if you have any questions throw them our way um let's see in the meantime, I always love to ask authors, um, what do you consider to be um, the most important part of your writing education? Was there something that stands out to you when you think about learning how to write that like really changed the game for you? Um, I, I, think, I think reading on writing by Stephen King, I was already writing, but I read it earlier on really let, let me just say, you have to struggle. You have to, you have to expect there to be a struggle to make it happen. And he put out, he had to deal with a lot of different things, but you have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, don't do it because it's not gonna be a reward if you're not getting that out of it. As I said earlier, writing is a lousy way to make a living, but a wonderful <laughs> way to make a life. And that's how I feel about it. So you gotta wanna do that. Uh, if, you, if, if you're worried about where you sit in the pecking order of life and how people are going to regard you, and that's what matters, a uh, writer may seem elegant, but if you're looking to make money, it's, it's, it's way down the totem pole on how you can make a living. So you've got to love what you're doing. You really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I uh, interesting. Yeah, uh, On Writing by Stephen King was a huge influence on me. Uh, Bird by Bird by Angela Lamont, yeah. I Lamont, like that. I read everything I could get my hands on, but I, I'm going to make a, a a plug for Elmore Leonard's Ten Rules of Writing. I just want <laughs> to have this here. Now, this is tongue in cheek, but I know, yeah. it's a great book. And it, yeah. you know, you, if you want to write, you need to get this book. And his tenth rule is. Leave out the things that people that the readers tend to skip. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a great book. It is. I also the, the, the birds. Uh, that book too. Uh, bird by bird. Yeah. Yeah, yeah bird by bird. Yeah. Book. I call it the bird book. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it makes sense. Exactly. So, and, Teresia is asking. If there's any chance we can get you to read the first few sentences of the book, how do you feel about that? <laughs> oh, I have no problem. I'll read it right All now. Right. I'm gonna get to the page. That's page one, right? Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Magda Magdalena Zoutis knew every pebble, rut, root, and pothole on the mountain path from her ancestral cottage down to the local spring. 
She made the trek every day, whether she needed water or not. She'd be doing it for more than a hundred years. First with her mother when she was four, later with her own children, grandchildren, and their children and grandchildren. She saw no reason to stop now. Many of her family members had moved to the Greek mainland, other islands or foreign countries to escape the harsh subsistence common on the Northern Aegean island of Icaria. But making a life away from this place, now known to the world as the island where people forgot to die, came at a price. And Magdalena wore black as a sign of her continued mourning for the husband, four children, and three grandchildren who'd passed away while she lived on. Longevity was the great blessing or curse of a life lived on Icaria. The average lifespan for men and women extended 10 years longer than elsewhere in Greece and one in three residents made it into their 90s. Living past 100 was not uncommon, and those who made it to centurion status enjoyed a special camaraderie forged through a shared century of maintaining the traditions and, obs and observances of their uniquely rigorous island way of life. Magdalena was cheery by nature, not one to dwell on happy thoughts, but today she felt particularly sad. The hardest deaths for her to endure, other than those among her family, were of children, childhood mates who also made it to the century mark or close to it. In each passing, she saw a bit of her own past die with them. Their deaths were to be expected, of course. But over the past weeks, so many of her friends from other parts of the island, indeed some of the healthiest, had passed on within days of each other. She wished there were no more funerals to attend, except perhaps for her own. No, not yet. She'd survived the pandemics of 1918 and 1920 and 2020 to 2022. It was not yet her time. I'm almost done. She heard the somber tolling of the church bells echoing up from the village through the craggy rock and pine tree ravine running by her stone home. In spring, this deep narrow gorge carried rushing water from the mountain that loomed above her cottage. But for now, it brought news of life events for those who understood the cadence of the bells. Today they spoke of another soul leaving Magdalena's world. Who, she wondered. Surely she would know the deceased, or at least someone in the family. She knew all the families, except of course for the newcomers, but few of them had stayed this past summer. One of her grandchildren would tell her who had passed on, along with other news from the island grapevine. No longer, she no longer walked to town to keep up with the gossip. They wouldn't allow her to make the journey. If they could, they'd have stopped her from making her daily trip to the spring. She smiled then sighed. I know it's because they care about me, but I can't stop now. I have more to do. Nice. Mm. That's the Thank first you. Thing. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, and I think that that is like a great way to end our evening together. So for everyone who would like to keep going, I'm going to link the book in chat one more time. So go ahead and follow those links over to the website. Of course, as always, audience members, let us know what you thought of this event, either in person or on any of our social media. We always, always, always love to hear from you. Warren and Jeffrey, thank you. A huge thank you for being here this evening. This has been so much fun. Do you have any last things you'd like to say before we uh, we wave goodbye. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Third Place Books, for all you do for we authors. We really appreciate it. And we all love you. <laughs> yes. A great independent bookshop. Thank you very much, Allie. <laughs> Thank you. It is absolutely our pleasure. All right. So I think that this is the time to do the awkward waving thing. So one last thank you and one last good night. And great let's do the... Jeff. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Warren, we'll catch up. Yeah, my best to Barbara. Well, that's quite some March. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Allie.